Stephanie here. Welcome back to my channel. Today I'll be talking about our third ASP strategy, which is assessing patients for IV to PO antimicrobial therapy step down. I'll be breaking the strategy up into three parts just because there is quite a bit of material to cover. In the first part, I'll be introducing the general principles and process that you should use when you're assessing whether you can change your patient's IV antibiotic to a PO form. The second and third video will each touch on the two types of IV to PO therapy switch. Um, so the second video will focus on the sequential IV to PO switch, and the third video will touch on the uh, step-down uh, type of IV to PO switch. Studies have shown that there are many benefits of switching someone from an IV antimicrobial to an oral form. These include less side effects associated with no longer having an IV catheter in situ. So you'll, you'll generally see a reduction in infection and clot formation. You'll see a reduction in workload on pharmacy and nursing staff, as well as a reduction in hospital costs. And most importantly, it can contribute to easing our healthcare system's pressure by decreasing our patient's hospital length of stay. And these benefits come with no additional harms to our patients. <coughs> Broadly speaking, there are two types of IV to oral switches. The first type is called sequential therapy, and the second type is called step-down. Sequential therapy refers to changing the same IV antimicrobial to its highly bioavailable oral form. Because the oral form is so well absorbed, it will maintain the same potency. An example of a sequential therapy switch is when you're changing IV ciprofloxacin to oral ciprofloxacin. The second type of IV to oral switch is called step-down therapy. So step-down refers to changing an IV antimicrobial to a completely different oral agent. And the oral antimicrobial agent may result in having a lower potency because of lower oral bioavailability, hence you're not achieving the high serum levels versus its IV form, or you're changing an IV uh, to an oral antibiotic in a completely different class or with a different spectrum of activity. An example of a step-down therapy switch would be changing IV ceftriaxone, which is a third-generation cephalosporin, to cefuroxine PO, which is a second-generation cephalosporin. When you look at IV to oral antimicrobial switch guidelines, you'll find that they usually suggest reviewing for such switch after two to three days of IV antibiotic therapy. The reason being is that it gives us time to figure out what's happening with our patients. It also gives us time to see how they're responding to their antimicrobial therapy regimen, and it allows time for the culture results to come back. These are the seven principles that you need to consider when you are reviewing whether your patients can be switched from their IV antimicrobial agent to an oral form. Number one, the patient continues to need antimicrobial therapy. Number two, the patient does not have an infection that may require prolonged IV therapy. I will list these out later. Number three, the patient is clinically stable at the time of the switch. Number four, the patient is showing clinical improvement since the start of their IV antibiotics. Number five, there's no factors that will affect how well the patient will absorb oral medications, including any drug interactions. Number six, the patient is eating and taking their oral medications without any problems. And you can ask a nurse if you're not sure. And number seven, you'll need to make sure that there is an oral option available based on the culture and indication that you're treating. To figure out whether your patient continues to need antimicrobial therapy requires you to figure out whether an infection has been diagnosed so far. I'll refer you to the first video of this mini-series on a more detailed approach on how to review a patient's antimicrobial therapy. Essentially, I would usually go to the patient's chart and look at the team's notes first to see what the working diagnosis is, and then go through the charts to see if their signs and symptoms, lab tests, culture results, imaging supports this diagnosis. So for example, if a patient is admitted with pneumonia, as stated in the team's notes, then you, I would usually see the following symptoms in their chart. Fever, shortness of breath, uh, their dyspneic, uh, their tachy, um, 
tachypnic, so increased respiratory rate. There's abnormal findings on the chest x-ray so, uh, suggesting pneumonia, and they're usually hypoxic, so requiring oxygen uh, therapy with nasal prong uh, or high flow oxygen, for example. If your patients have the following infections, don't review the switch yourself. Suggest that an ID specialist be consulted, if not already done, to review whether the patient will be suitable for such switch. The reason being is that some oral antimicrobial therapy is not appropriate for some of these infections because we're not able to achieve adequate concentrations at the site of infection. To assess whether your patient is clinically improving or stable, look at their vital signs. There should be no fever for at least one or two days, and there should be no unexplained tachycardia or hypotension. Their white blood cell count should also be decreasing, granted that they're not on any other medications such as corticosteroids that would affect this. Whatever symptoms that they came in with that is supporting their infectious diagnosis, such as dyspnea or shortness of breath for pneumonia, should also be improving. So the patients should be able to tell you that they're less short of breath with the antibiotic that they're receiving so far. To assess for factors affecting oral absorption, look into the chart or ask the team members or the nurses if you're not clear uh, to make sure that there are none of the following factors. The patients should not be experiencing severe or persistent diarrhea or vomiting. There should be no GI tract obstruction, such as ileus or a malabsorption syndrome. There should be no active GI bleed or continuous gastric suctioning if there's a nasal gastric tube. There should be no GI tract abnormality that would impact or reduce the extent of oral absorption of oral medications, such as a resection of a significant amount of their small bowel, like short bowel syndrome. And there should be no drug interactions that will reduce the amount of the oral drug absorbed. The sixth principle is very similar to the fifth one. Here, you're reviewing to see if the patient is able to tolerate their oral medications. First, check their chart to make sure they're not MPO, meaning nothing to be given by mouth. If they're already on oral feeds or oral diet, then you can check with your nursing and dietitian colleagues to make sure they are tolerating their anterior feeds okay and that there is not a high gastric residual. Uh, if they're on an oral solid diet, make sure they're not vomiting up their food. There should be no swallowing disorders that would prevent them from effectively swallowing their oral pills. And you can also check their MAR to see if they are refusing their oral medications. For the seventh principle, we just want to make sure that there is a oral antimicrobial agent for you to change the patient to. If you have culture and sensitivity data, then pull up those data and see if the bug is sensitive to any oral antimicrobial agent. If we are treating the infection empirically, meaning that there is no culture data to guide your therapy, then you'll need to look at your local and national guidelines to see if there is a oral alternative that you can change your patient to. So this concludes the first part of the IV to PO mini mini series. In the second part of uh, this mini mini series, I'll use the seven principles and I'll talk about how to review a patient for a sequential therapy switch. And part three of this video, again, I'll be using the same seven principles and taking you through a step-down therapy switch. I hope you found this video helpful. Feel free to drop me a comment below if you have any further questions surrounding this topic or if you have any IV to oral switch experience that you'd like to share. Till next time, bye for now.